My name is Mason Matthews. I'm a managing director with Donnelly Financial Solutions. So I've been working with private companies, helping them manage, secure content, and then ultimately file all their documentation with the SEC for 20 plus years. So Patrick and I met when we were going through the Entropic project. There's some interesting stories that we'll share kind of going through the, the process today. But what we really wanted to do was come here and really talk about managing through rapid growth. So um, real quick, let me just give you his bio. It was a really nice intro, but I'll, I'll kind of fill in some of the additional stuff. So Patrick is a serial entrepreneur and founder and CEO of Quest Fusion, a San Diego-based consulting company that provides strategic guidance to entrepreneurs and startup companies. Patrick is the former CEO of Entropic Communications, where he took the company from a pre-product to pre-revenue to a successful IPO on NASDAQ and eventually a billion dollar valuation. Patrick has raised over 200 million in equity capital for his companies and executed on over 2 billion in M&A transactions. He's a re regular contributor to Inc. Magazine, Entrepreneur, Huffington Post, and Fast Company. He is the author of Plan, Commitment, Win, 90 Days to Creating a Fundable Startup, which is available on Amazon.com, Amazon, Amazon Kindle as an ebook, and audio book on, uh, um, and, and, and as an audio book on Audible. That's a mouthful. Patrick also loves working with entrepreneurs on their most challenging problems. He also enjoys golf, tennis, fine wine, snow skiing, angel investing, and spending time with his family. You can also find Patrick on Twitter, at QuestFusion. So one of the things that you know, Patrick and I got together and we were talking a little bit about this as well. Would you guys like stools? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, if, you, if you could, yeah, might be easier. Is there any way to like not have the things going? So sure. <laughs> A little distracting, a little distracting. So I'll tell, yeah. I'll, I'll tell a story while Gary's getting to school. So when, um, when Traffic, Traffic made the decision to go public in late 2006, and basically we, we had gotten to the point where we were worth too much for our large kind of potential acquisition target to buy us, which was Broadcom. So we had a conversation with CBS, which was in January. They were like, you know, we want to pay this much. My board felt the company was worth this much. So we decided that we already had kind of a backup plan in the event that we didn't sell the company. I still felt like we were subscale to run a public company, so we had an intent to buy another San Diego-based company called RF Magic. So bought the company, a lot of process to get that acquisition done because it was a stock-based transaction. Both companies were private. We got it done kind of in mid-June, July. And we went through the SEC filing process, which took about three months, so it was a little bit complex. So eventually, kind of around the time of Thanksgiving, we were like ready to go out on the actual roadshow. And this is when I met Mason. Mason does all the financial printing. So at the time, he had one competitor, and now he has zero competitors. So it's a great business to be in. But um, we were ready. We were like actually at the airport, ready to fly to New York for the IPO roadshow. And, um, one of our, our second largest customer, our second largest end customer, kind of, they didn't really threaten to sue us, but he kind of made, and I've known this guy for 20 years, but he kind of made these illusions that, hey, what, what would happen if you guys went public and the Monday after, you know, we filed a lawsuit against you guys? So, in the background, the bankers and lawyers were talking about this, we basically got pulled back from the IPO, but all of the employees thought that I was on the IPO roadshow, so I couldn't go back to a tropic to work, so I actually worked at RR Donnelly for like a week while, while half the time in Denver like negotiating with the customer and the, the other half of the time well, with, with Donnelly. So uh, that's how Mason and I got to know each other. He, was, or he would order me lunch every day. It was from really nice places. So it was, it was kind of a, a great experience. Yeah, the, the, the IPO is an interesting process. And that was one of the other pieces we were going to talk about is that when you're going through that process and you file your, your information publicly, some of the rules have changed since Patrick did this with Entropic. But you're really beholden to additional information that's going to come out, right. and, and different people that um, you know, customers and things of that nature. People might come out of the woodwork and, and threaten to sue you because you're really in a very public place at that point in time, having to deal with all the stuff that can have very large ramifications. And, and I, 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 like I said, I've known this guy for many years, and you know, I went up there to Denver, got the red eye flight, you know, just the whole thing. He's like, we don't trust you guys anymore, and. 
like about halfway through the negotiation, we're like in this room, and at this particular facility, you need a, an employee badge to get out to go to the bathroom, and he handed me his wallet, which has an employee badge, and it, it had like a couple thousand dollars, and I'm like, yeah, I know you don't trust me work. So, but it was his way to kind of get his last pound of flesh while he had some leverage, and they got it, and it ended up going public. Yeah. So one of the things that what we wanted to try to do here today was really talk about managing through rapid growth. But when Patrick and I were talking about the best way to present this, we really wanted to make it a little bit more of an open forum. So I'm going to get started with some questions, but please feel free to jump in. Hopefully everybody can hear us. We both tend to talk pretty loud. But um, yeah, if you have any questions, raise your hand and, and we'll go from there. But really, first off, how do you define rapid growth? What is that? Well, at the time, like there's, there's been three companies in my career where I've kind of had this, you know, luxury of having this rapid growth. I, I was um, the marketing manager, eventually the marketing director of the memory business at, at AMD, um, where we took the flash memory business from a million dollars a quarter to a hundred million dollars a quarter over like a three year period of time. And then at CQ Microsystems, we took you know, the video CD business and the DVD business from zero to several hundred million dollars over a two to three year period of time. So there's a couple different, um, I think Inc. has like a, a Fast 500 and there's a, a Deloitte Fast 500. We were part of the Deloitte Fast 500, which basically measures it over a, a five year compound annual growth rate and it has to be you know, a 60, 70% kind of compound annual growth rate over that period of time. So you're really growing very, very fast and there's a lot of chaotic stuff that happens uh, during that, that type of growth. What, uh, what are some of the biggest challenges you tend to find that is a recurring theme that might be applicable to this audience? Well, I think that, I mean, I'm assuming most of you guys are you know, CEOs and founders of companies, so if, you're the, if the CEO of a, of a startup company especially, not so much a big company, but as a startup company, you have three main hats. You, know, you have to worry about the people, and you're building a culture, you're building an employee base, so you have to be worried about that all the time. You have to be worried about running the company or the operational piece, and then you have to be worried about having enough money or kind of fuel in the tank to fuel the growth. Because even if you're going through this period of rapid growth and you're not part of a larger company, you're typically plowing every dollar that you make back into it. In fact, in fact, a lot of times more than that because you have to carry so much inventory and you have to have you know, big accounts receivables and you're a small company so you're not getting the best credit terms. So you have to be kind of worried about all three of those things. And, and the, the challenges within managing rapid growth are still those same three things, but the focus moves from kind of the core to the periphery. And what I mean by that is when you don't have customers, you know, and you're just focused on product development and on R&D, that's one set of challenges. But when you start having all these customers and customer problems, you have a lot of problems on the supply chain side, kind of ramping production quickly enough, and on the customer side where they're complaining about stuff all the time, no matter how good things are, you're always going to run into problems. So it's, you're, you have to keep the product development engine going, but you're spending so much time out here that you have to do that because otherwise the whole, the whole thing breaks. You want to jump into money first? That's always a, always sure, a fun one. Sure, sure. Um, so, so based on what you've experienced with the different companies that you've worked in, what would you do differently now with the hindsight that you have in and around money? Is there anything big that kind of jumps out at you right out of the gate? Things that I would do differently. That's always a tough question because they have the benefit of hindsight. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, I've always had a bias towards making sure you had a little bit more than enough. Not like, I've never run a company or been fortunate to run a company that have like tons of cash, you know, just sitting around where I need a garden rake to kind of clean it up. So, but you need to have enough money and kind of plan ahead. Um, like a lot of the, the entrepreneurs I deal with in, in, in my, my advisory business, they want to treat um, raising capital as an event. So, okay, now, I'm time, now it's time to raise money. Come to me, introduce me to your network. Here's, you know, if I have an executive summary, here it is. But a lot of times they don't have the toolkit necessary to go out and raise capital. And it's raising capital is a process, it's not an event. Even in an IPO, um, which is kind of the most accelerated version of that, because there's so much more money in the, the public markets, it's a three week process. But the process leading up to that is a good four or five months at least. 
And when you're raising private capital, it's a five to seven month process, whether you're raising a seed round or a series A or a series B. So you need to kind of be planning ahead and making sure you have enough runway that you can kind of make it through there and run the business. And in the event of when you're going through rapid growth, because of the working capital requirements, you've got a lot of inventory requirements potentially. If you have a product-based business, if you're more of a SaaS or, or software-based business, not as much. And then you've got a lot of things related to accounts receivable. And sometimes on a software business, that can be even more problematic because you have these weird contracts that you're in and you know people don't pay on time and you know, you've got a bunch of different things that you have to do there. So I think making sure that you manage your cash is really, really important in especially managing through rapid growth. What, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about fuel in the tank and when is kind of the, the right time to maybe try to go public and, and doing that sort of stuff. Obviously that's a little bit further down the line for a lot of the people in this audience, but just in terms of maybe doing A round, B round, going out and asking for enough money, can you speak a little bit to, to some of that sort of stuff? Yeah, I mean, I'm a proponent of, if you can avoid it, don't ever take venture capital, you know, because it's like you lose control of your life, you lose control of your company. But there are some instances where it makes a lot of sense. You know, if you need to raise three to five million dollars in a, in, a, in a Series A or more, there's very few sources where you can get that that amount of capital in the private markets. Um, but you've got to believe that you can drive a billion dollar valuation, not not just with that capital, but over the period of a Series A, Series B, Series C, and that, that's a different type of a company. So not all companies are really built that way. So, but. Um, Delaying that, prolonging that as much as possible, even if you have a company like that, is going to be to your benefit. So bootstrapping as long as you can, getting friends and family money, getting kind of friendly angel money where people have like really technical, deep technical or domain expertise in your company and they kind of like you and they like what you're doing technologically and they give you a little more grace. Um, I think that that's always good. But the um, when you kind of start moving to that series A round, and I've got a panel that Gary set up on, on Wednesday that specifically is talking about this, where you're kind of raising growth capital, there's just a different set of requirements that venture investors are looking for. So a lot of uh, <coughs> folks that come to me kind of to help them raise money, like I want to raise a million dollars, I'm like, that's that's really hard. You know, it's, I can help you raise 250 to 500 from angels, or I can help you raise three to five with some venture investors, but a million dollars is kind of a tough number because you're kind of in no man's land. So um, you need to kind of know what you want to do with the money, what milestones you can accomplish over the next 12 to 18 months, and you basically raise money in kind of 12 to 18 month increments. So you've got to have, have to kind of think backwards with that type of a plan and kind of go from there. So on the, on the milestones piece, and this is something we, a little off script of what we had talked about, what happens when you maybe don't hit those milestones and you have to go back out and, and ask for additional dollars? That's always a, it's always a challenge that lots of companies have to face. It's real world activities. Maybe yeah, I mean, I, I, nobody ever hits all their milestones. You know, I'm sorry, you know, it just doesn't happen. And you know, you, we all know that in order for you to have a growth company, you have to have hockey stick mm -hmm. revenue growth. And, I had this joke, I have it in the book, like hockey stick revenue growth, and I see these graphs all the time with people pitching me for investment. I'm like so excited to find out what the catalyst is that causes this hyper growth. And I'm completely disappointed, so I might as well put an arrow that says the miracle happens here. So in the book, I go through like eight things that I've gone through that actually are catalysts, but it's, um, it's one of those crazy things where you know that if you're in the right kind of market, that does have the potential for explosive growth, there will be catalysts that make that happen. You know it will happen, but you can never predict it with complete accuracy. So a lot of it is the explanation around it. You know, you miss a milestone. Is it because you just made shit up? Or is it because, you know, your assumptions were a little bit wrong? You know, the customer's not ramping here, but they're ramping here, but we still have it under control and things are good. You know, so doing your homework and, and knowing what the underlying um, catalyst or the underlying you know, triggers for those things. And some of those things would be like, you know, I need to have, you know, if you're in a SaaS business, I've got to have you know, 10,000 customers at this type of royalty rate or this type of licensing fee or this type of subscription level for me to get to kind of the next level of validation and proof around this market. 
So maybe you only have 5,000, but there's a reason why. You had to tune the product up or you learned something from the customers or something like that. So those can all be kind of valid reasons why things didn't happen exactly as you expected them to. What about when uh, the terms first come back from the VC? And so you know, you're all excited to basically finally get somebody that's interested to you know, give you some money however they want, a very big chunk of your company. So maybe, is there, is there a formula that everybody seems to use or is there a better way to, to manage that and then also maybe how much of a you know, control from a board perspective they want to take? What's, what's your rule of thumb on that? Yeah, I mean, typically, whether you're doing a, a seed round or a series A or a series B, you're, you're typically going to give up somewhere between, call it 15 and 25% of the company for whatever amount of money you raise. So you kind of have to work backwards with the amount of money that you can actually raise and kind of that, that kind of determines the valuation. So in a seed round, like I said, you know, if you can, you know, I, I see companies regularly raise 250, 500, even a million. I mean, I have a buddy of mine that's raised 1.2 million in, in seed financing in a convert, you know, a convertible debt offering versus a priced round. Now he didn't do it all at once, you know, he did it over a two year period of time. But you know, he's had people write him twenty-five thousand dollar checks, and he's had people write him two hundred thousand dollar checks. So you do see that kind of happening. Um, that typically doesn't happen once you do your first price round, which would be like a Series A. Um, you know, anytime I've like got an initial term sheet, I like am dancing in the hallways because it's like so exciting to have somebody's actually interested in investing in the company because you talk to you know so many people over so many months and so many touches with these people because they're. Their, their natural bias is to say no, especially venture capitalists. I mean, they're looking at hundreds of deals and hundreds of executive summaries. So then it's like, if you actually do get a meeting, you know, they're looking for a reason to say no. Either this is a stupid business idea, or if it is a good business idea, this is the wrong person, or this is the wrong team, or whatever. So there's there's a lot of overcoming skepticism and you know, setting setting expectations, you know, exceeding expectations, setting milestones, beating and beating those over a period of months. And um, anytime I've raised private money, there's been three or four kind of significant touches and probably half a dozen other kind of email touches and phone calls and things like that before somebody is willing to give you a term sheet. So when that happens, a lot of it depends have you done a price round before? You know, if you've done a, if you've done a price round at a Series A, you want the Series B to be an up round. You know, you don't want the A guys to get diluted because then they're all pissed off. So, a, a lot of it is that's the most important thing. Is like let's make sure it's at least an up round, and that the people that have already invested are okay with what's happening going forward. When you kind of run into these. Um, write down situations, which I've been fortunate that, not to be in those, I've been an investor in some of those and I've been on the board of some of those, it gets very ugly. You know, it's like, it's just a, it's a bad, <laughs> it's a bad situation. It never, it never works out very good. Sure. So, you know, sometimes the company gets shut down. Sometimes there's a washout of the existing investors. Sometimes the existing investors, if they put more money in, they're, they're kept whole. So it's just, it's, it's never a real easy situation. What about um, how much should if somebody sitting in this audience if gets a, somebody to join their board, should they expect them to participate in kind of thought leadership and, and things of that nature around what they're gonna be doing with the company? And then also for, you know, if you talk about dry powder and, and having additional kind of wherewithal to jump back in in the future if they need to, how much of a consideration should they worry about that when they're maybe measuring a couple different types of offers that they might be getting? Well, I mean, board seats are one of your most valuable assets as a founder or a startup CEO. So you have to be very picky about who you put on your board. You know, as a as a private company, you know, you might have a co-founder and it's just the two of you on the board initially while you're kind of in that bootstrapping and friends and family phase, maybe you get some kind of high-powered angel investor that has a lot of domain or technical expertise in your area, maybe you make them a board member, or maybe they're just an advi a board advisory member. Typically, when you raise a Series A with venture capital, you are gonna give up a couple board seats. So you wanna make sure that you're working with people that are gonna be reasonable on the board. And you know, deal terms outside of valuation are sometimes as important or more important than, than the valuation. I mean, value, what's important in valuation is that 
you're looking at the end zone. You're looking at either where do you want to end up with an, from an ownership stake when you sell the company or when you take it public. So you're going to have a lot of bumps in the road, you know, during that period of time. Actually, I was starting on that with the IPO, but if you have something that has like massive anti-dilution privileges or you know a lot of different write downs or like a lot of the unicorn valuations, they're always focused on the unicorn valuation, but any new money that comes in below a certain valuation completely washes out all the founders. So it's you got to be very careful about that. You have to be careful about corporate governance. You know who you get on the board. Are they going to be a reasonable person? A future investor, they're going to look at your existing investors and they'll be like, I don't want I don't want to work with that guy or gal. I don't want to work with that person. So they can be poison to your company for getting future investors. So kind of having your eyes open around all that stuff is is really important. So uh, before we move on, does anybody have any questions? I just figured I'd jump in and ask. Yeah. How many um, different boards have you been on? Five. Board so of directors or board, of, board of advisors, directors, a little bit of both? Those are boards of directors. I've been some, on some other advisory boards. Do you prefer one or the other? Yeah, I mean, I think being on the board of, director, board of directors is more fun. You kind of have a more active role, um, but there's typically more involvement, you know, because there's like, Regular involvement when things are good, and then there's very active involvement when things go sideways. But, I mean, to me, that's part of the fun of it, too. Now, three of those are companies I've run. So then two, two were on other other companies that I was a board member on. The fun of it when it goes sideways? Is that what you mean? Sentence? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, <laughs> when, it, it's not fun if you're a CEO and things are going sideways. Yeah, okay. it's, not, it's not very <laughs> fun at all. I mean, you're having board meetings every week, and, you know, you have daily action items, and it's like, are you kidding me? But it's up to do your day job. Yeah. One other question over here. Uh, yeah. There's some signs to tell if a venture capitalist is trying to take advantage of you versus if they're really trying to help you. That's a really good They're breathing. They're breathing. breathing. By, <laughs> by, taking, by taking advantage of like, you. Like just trying to take too much equity in your company yeah, or, yeah. or really <laughs> strong arming you in the negotiation or something, something like that. And you know, if you're a first time entrepreneur, like, how can you tell uh, if that's happening? Like, are there some key red flags? Or? Well, there, I think that, first off, I think there's so many different deal terms <laughs> other than valuation that are important. And it's really important you get a good corporate counsel mm -hmm. that has seen a lot of deals and actively sees deals and has worked with VCs and they've worked, you know, on M&A transactions, they've worked on IPO transactions. So they, they have all the real, real-time data. So I think that's, that's important because then they're going to know what's standard versus what's not standard, and you can talk to them about that. Um, aside from that, I would say, you know, there's kind of rules of thumb around, you know, if you're, if you're raising a round, you're typically going to give up in that 15 to 25%. <coughs> you know, I have people approaching me for angel investment, and they want to give up 5% of their company, and I'm like, I just don't see how the numbers work around that. And, but I'm not, I don't go in and say, you know, give me 35%. I'm just like, I'm not interested. Yeah. So, but a, a VC, if they're really interested in the company, you know, maybe they're going to push a little harder. That it's a negotiation, you know. So where, when you're doing any negotiation, what you want to do is create scarcity. And if there is no scarcity, you will be taken advantage of most of the time. Now, will you be taken advantage of to the point that it's like predatory? Maybe, maybe not. How important are you to the company? You know, if you're really important to the company, they're going to want to take care of you, and they're going to want to make sure that you stick around, and you know that you're driving the business. But it's something that, like, okay, I can take this over, kick you out, and they don't care. You know, different story. Do you have a technique for creating scarcity in the negotiation that you use? I think you just you have to. And I've never been in one of those situations where people are just throwing money in term sheets at me. So, you know, it's, everything is hard, you know, yeah. it's grinding and grinding and grinding. So, I think that having a good list, working that list, making sure you have good touch points, making sure you're keeping in touch with people, making sure you're not directly playing people off of each other, but saying, hey, you know, there's some interest in this, you know, we're, we're making progress, you know, what we told you here, we're exceeding it, this customer has come in, and trying to get that first person to come in, because in, in the venture industry, everybody's a follower. You know, unless it's Kleiner Perkins or Sequoia and they know the entrepreneur and, you know, they've done business with somebody on their board before or something like that. All the rest of us, 
we're just basically commodity is and you know they got to kind of figure out is it real or not real because there's so much stuff out there that is bad ideas or bad management teams so they want to test this over a period of time but if they if they get to know like and trust you then there is a possibility they get interested and likely because of the way they think and the metrics that they use you're going to get multiple people interested at the same time then you got to try to close you got to try to get a term sheet you get a term sheet then you should build other term sheets yeah. How much time can you expect um, somebody to give you as a board member? If I put somebody on my board member, how many hours am I kind of entitled to from them per month? I think that's Which a good... Which is a loose question, I know. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that's a good conversation to have prior to putting them on the board and what you desire, what you want. You know, what I tell people is that, um, yeah, you know, if you want me as an advisory board member, I'm available by phone, you know, maybe for an advisory board meeting, you know, if you have something like that, you know, every other month, once a quarter. Board members of private companies, you typically, you know, you have some committee work, but the committee work is relatively light compared to a public company. So maybe they're on the comp committee or maybe they're on the audit committee. So they have to be available for a meeting once a quarter for something like that. They have to be available you know, once every six weeks for board meetings, because when you're public, it's typically quarterly board of meetings, unless things are going bad, then they're, like there are board meetings behind your back over here, and then there are <laughs> board meetings with you like every other week. So but that's the typical type of thing. Then being available by phone, if there's somebody that's like a real expert, you know, and you've had that kind of agreement, kind of handshake agreement up front, hey, I want to be able to bounce ideas off of you or ask you for an introduction or whatever, and you kind of clear that up front, then you're typically available for that. But if you like want them to come in and actually work and do like projects, you know, if I'm on a board and someone's like, I want three months of your dedicated time to help me work through my product plan, I'm like, that's not implicit within our agreement. You know, I'll, I'll do a, a consulting deal with you if you want to do something like that, but that's beyond the scope of, of being on your board. Okay. We got one over here and we got one more. Yeah. How do relationships change as you go through the thing? Going into A, going into B, the growth, and you have the people you're working with, your 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 colleagues. Uh, I don't want to throw out particular titles, but yeah. whatever seems appropriate to you. That to me is one of the really interesting challenges of managing. I I haven't seen it, I haven't experienced it. What's what is it like those relationships and, and how you manage that growth with them? I mean, it, it, it depends on the individuals involved. And there, there are, let's say you have a VP of marketing or a VP of engineering, and they're the <coughs> engineering, or let's, let's say in the case of a tropic, I had, I had a VP of sales that was our first VP of sales. Awesome guy, still a friend of mine today. Great working with a team of five people and some reps. Totally wrong guy to run a multinational organization with country managers all over the world and so there was a point in time where it's like this isn't going to work we're growing too fast we need to make a change I'd like to find a spot for you doing this he wasn't interested so he decided to go be a VPSL somewhere else so I think if you're honest with people you have those situations like the an, another kind of situation that you run into in I came into Tropic at a relatively early stage. You know, they had product development, but they didn't have any products, they didn't have any revenue. So there were four founders, one of them was, you know, kind of sidelined before I got there, so three were left when I got there. And the guy that is that the C was the CEO, the founding CEO, I've known him for 15, 20 years when I came into Entropic, so we've known each other for 30 years. Great guy. The other two guys are also great guys, but they're they're startup guys, which what I mean by that is when you want to start a revolution, you need anarchists. When you want to establish law and order, anarchists can be extremely disruptive. So sometimes people aren't willing to make the adjustment. And when you're in those situations, you have to say, you know, how much value is there versus collateral damage on pretty much a daily basis. And the reason why I have so much gray hair, partially hereditary, but partially from dealing with founders in three different companies. So it's challenging. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and you know, they've all made money, but you know, it's one of those things where sometimes you have to part ways because it just doesn't work. So 
In, in Tropic, as an example, I would say there was probably management team 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 that were at various different stages of the company and I was there 11 years. So, and seven years as a public company. But when we bought our magic, it was this blended management team, so that was kind of 2.0, we worked through that. Though as we started getting bigger and doing a lot of acquisitions and became a much larger company, that was kind of 3.0. There was one other question. So I'm sure that everyone's different, but do you find that board of directors care about membership classes all that much, A and B shares, especially if the owner has 100%? Yeah, I mean, they definitely care about preferred versus common, and they want to be preferred, they want the founders and the employees to be a common stock. So that's part of the, the deal terms, is what kind of preferences do they have with that preferred stock. Then as you get to different classes of preferred, A, B, C, it really depends on the negotiation that goes on during that, that, that financing round. You know, the, the, the Series A preferred, they definitely don't want the Series B preferred to have preferences versus them, but they will. But how does the participation happen? So a lot, there can be a lot of technical details that go on in that, and that's why having a good attorney really helps to kind of help work through that. Um, having a good finance person, too, that sees a lot of deals is really helpful. Just for a quick poll in the audience, and, and I'll get you your question in a second. How many people have actually raised money or are in the process of doing it right now? Just give us a show of hands real quick. From people other than It can be friends and family. It can be, yeah, anybody. Okay. You got a question? Yes, so how do you um, evaluate like a, a management team in USA? Sometimes you have like a bad management team. How do you, how can you be able to, to figure that out? Because very often you will have the CEO basically hide, you know, what is going on in the company to the board. So are you saying as a board member or investor assessing the management yeah. team or as yeah. a CEO investor? As, 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 as a board member, how, how, do, you, how do you see, I mean, uh, you, typically, I suppose that you should ask some questions, but it's not always the case. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> board, board members, even if they're good, get 90% plus of their information from the CEO. So it's kind of hard to assess that. I mean, in the case of, you know, the companies I run, not in not Quest Fusion, but in Tropic and the two <coughs> companies, they were established when I came in. So. Um, the board had communication with the founders, with me, you know, I always provide kind of high level of transparency. I had my management team in board meetings and, you know, had them presenting and things like that. So I think that's a good kind of, if a, if a board member does that, I think there's a good thing. If the CEO does that without a board member asking, I think it's a good thing. Um, but you, you, there's a difference between managing the CEO and managing the company. And in my view, the board's job is to manage the CEO. If a board wants to manage the company, I'll give them the keys to the car. Because I, I, I can't do that. If you want, you know, with, with limited information and not really knowing what's going on, you're gonna tell me exactly what to do, I can't do that. But you always get that testing period in the beginning of a company where it's like, they want a lot of information, so you write, you know, a 15-page memo that says this is why I did this negotiation this way, and get their confidence so they know you're not an idiot. And then over time, that you build trust with them, and then basically there, there's still those friction times where, you know, there's never a right answer. You know, how how do you defend yourself without becoming defensive? So you know, hard. it's it's hard. You know. Okay. <laughs> My point is that, for example, I mean, if you and I've seen that in other companies. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was an HR executive in companies, so yeah. I, mean, I care about the people. Uh, and I've seen really bad things happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, down uh, with, with those CEOs. And we see that with Uber right now, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, you get people uh, who are like CEOs, good business people per se. They can generate the revenue, they can do this kind of things. Yeah. But then they are like, they are destroying their company from the inside. Oh, and, so, and, so and boards, I, I would just say, my, my experience, my opinion from looking and being involved, living in Silicon Valley for 10 years, yeah. and some crazy people, is that boards care about performance. And performance is primarily about the top line and the bottom line. And if things are good on the top line and the bottom line, 
as long as somebody's not psychotic, <laughs> they don't care. If they're going to be embarrassed by the psychoticness of the CEO, they'll fire the CEO. But, but now the CEO are much more like visible on social media. So I think that the conversations are going to be changed. I think there's definitely more of that. You know, there's yeah. there's other influencers based on that. So that is happening. I mean, you see it in sports, you see it in, in business, you see it all over the place. But the you're, you're dealing generally with a very um, homogeneous set of board members. I mean, 95% of venture capitalists are white guys, you know, and most of them, you know, are between 35 and, you know, 65 or whatever it is. So diversity really doesn't exist. It doesn't exist very much on public boards either, although it's getting better. But over time, as those shifts change, some of, the, some of the things I'm talking about will change. But I'm just being realistic. What I've witnessed is that, you know, Henry Nicholas at Broadcom, the guy was fucking crazy. <laughs> but until the numbers started going sideways or until the board was like scared that they were going to get in trouble, then they finally took action. But he did a great yeah, job in many ways. Him. He built an incredible yeah, company. Yeah, that's so we're, we're, yeah, quite quite often companies get like to A rounds, B rounds at least. I, I think that's maybe your experience. They have one product essentially. Yeah. And now, you know, at what point do you start dealing with? Does it need to be a second trick? Um, how, how do you manage it, it that? It depends on how good the first trick is. Yeah. You know, if you're in the microprocessor business and you're Intel, I mean, they had memories before that, but. Right. Great trick, 20 year, 25 year trick, you know, package software, you know, operating system, Microsoft, great trick, you know, side trick of, you know, Office, the Office suite. But in the package software business, that was a pretty good run. You know, it was like a 25, 30 year run based on basically three products. You know, Qualcomm, based on, you know, CDMA technology, pretty good run. Many you know, products, though. Yeah, but that's unusual. You know, there's a handful of companies, Google and Search. You know, Google spends tons of money on all this other shit. It doesn't really matter. But Search is what generates all the revenue, and they've got 85% market share. You know, after, I, I mean, I, I met Sergi and, and Larry at a Client Perkins thing back in 2002, and Google had already been around for five or seven years at that point. So, I mean, they've got a good 20-year run on search. You know, who thought yeah. search would be that valuable? You know, so it really depends on the company. How, how big is the market? How fast is the market growing? How much are you able to differentiate yourself and be able to kind of continue to generate a lot of cash by doing that? Most companies don't have that luxury. Broadcom was different. You know, Broadcom had two products initially. They had cable modems and they had Ethernet. But by the time they got sold to Avago, they, I mean, they were in pretty much every communications technology under the planet. So they did have to do a lot of diversification. Now, they did most of their diversification through acquisition, same way with Cisco. Cisco built up a company initially in routers, but then they did like 50 acquisitions of smaller companies and kind of went that route. So really, I think it depends. But in my situation, we definitely had to come up with some other products, and even that wasn't fast enough. Because there's just, you, the technology business isn't, and the chip business in particular, isn't the business, the good business it used to be 20 years ago. It's much tougher. And there's a lot more consolidation going on. So it's really tough to build a chip company. And software business, I think it's still pretty good. But that's getting, it's good to kind of get to revenue and get to initial growth. It's hard to scale an enterprise software beyond that because the established players are so big with the big companies that getting channels to market, getting access to those customers is sometimes tough. Maybe talk a little bit more about that with the operations piece and how, you know, is there going through rapid growth, just focusing in a little bit more on the operations to kind of address some of those? Issues? Well, I mean, even even as a CEO, you have to you have to go where the problem is, even if it seems like it's the minutia. I remember the situation in uh, in Entropic. We're ramping our business, and you know, our suppliers didn't believe our forecasts, and our forecasts ended up being under what the actual volume requirements were. So we're constantly on the phone with TSMC, which is our big chip supplier, and Amcor, our big packaging supplier. And Amcor has this problem, like we can't get enough substrates. It's the thing that they put the chip on top of before they put it in the package. So I'm getting on the phone with them. First, my operations guy gets on the phone with them. 
I'm like, who's the substrate manufacturer? And they're like, oh, I don't know, we gotta look it up. So they look it up and I'm like, Tim, let's get on a plane and go and meet these guys. And see if we can kind of get some more substrates. So we show up this place and um, they had never seen anybody like us. We were like gods to them, you know, people that were, we're so far down the food chain, <laughs> they're like, they've never met people that are actually sell products. So we're like, hey, we have this problem, can you help us out? They're like, sure. You know, problem was solved like in a week. Whereas if we would have just dealt with Amcor, it, it may not even be solved today. So you've got to jump on those things. You've got to say, where's the pain point and what does this mean to my business and what, where is this causing a problem? And it might seem kind of stupid to like, you know, go on a 14 hour flight to meet with not even your supplier, but your supplier's supplier. But sometimes you have to do that if that's where the problem is. Same way with customers. I mean, if, if a customer, maybe they're even a mid sized customer, maybe they're not your largest customer, but they can destroy your reputation, you know, you got to go out and meet with them and find out what the problem is and give them FaceTime. And, you know, I'm a proponent of giving updates even when there's no update. You know, I get on the phone with a customer and it's like, they're so upset that, you know, I was like, I get on the phone with them the next day. Hey, I'm just updates you that we're still working hard on it. We don't have a solution yet, but we're focused on this and we're going to solve this problem. It's not even an update, but it makes them feel better because they know that I'm thinking about it. It's a thought line. What about, uh, back to Gary's point in, in diversification of your product? Do you worry about becoming, you know, a mile wide and inch deep as opposed to having more focus on, you know, maybe a second version of something that's coming out, different uh, iterations of that. Yeah, I mean, that's a big, a big topic. Let me see if I can boil it down to, I think as a, as an early stage startup, I'm not a proponent of, you know, going after these large horizontal markets where you're, you know, going to have a one to three percent market share in this multi-billion dollar market. I, I don't think you can win that way. I've never seen a company win that way. I think you got to carve out a, a target product market segment where you can have a dominant position, get 70, you know, initially 100% market share, and then maybe end up with 70 or 80% market share over time, and then island hop and get into adjacent markets, either adjacent products or adjacent markets over time, and build off of that base. So, when do you make those hops? It's when you the baby's not going to die anymore. You know, that you don't you don't have babies and toddlers that need care and feeding every single day. Maybe they're like teenagers, so. You know, you still need to watch them like a hawk, but you can actually have more babies, you know, and do other so things. That's <laughs> exactly, that's hard. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's it's hard for somebody that's a great parent. Yeah, yeah. You know, but if you're like, okay, this is the first time I've raised children before, or you know, started a company before, that can be really challenging. And that's why I think also why Broadcom was very successful was when they did acquisitions, the CEOs of those companies stuck around. You know, the Henrys incentivized them and did the right things and let them kind of run their own show. So, I mean, he was in everybody's face, but at the same time, he had very capable managers that were running those adjacent product lines. So maybe maybe talk a little bit about that just with the last couple minutes we've got here. Uh, just in terms, you know, I've, I've heard you talk about this a bunch before that, you know, building companies is a team sport. So if you start to bring on additional people to raise these children, um, how do you think about doing that and keeping the culture kind of the same? I've heard a number of different people talk about it, but uh, interested in your perspective. I think it's like the, the schizophrenia of being a startup CEO. You know, you want to spend and invest a lot, but you also want to be super frugal. You want to give your employees a lot of room to operate, but you still got to not micromanage in the sense of telling them how to do it, but knowing the details about what they're doing. You have to really be in the details. And, you know, there's that delicate balance. You know, when people say, what is your management style? I say, it's situational. You know, if you're, if the house is burning down, I'm grabbing a bucket and hoses and like, you know, we gotta put this fire out. Whereas if you're building houses, it's a different type of management. So it really depends, you know, and, and, and it depends on the people. And, Sometimes it depends on the people on a certain day. You know, maybe Bob is like this on Wednesdays and Bob is like this on Fridays or Monday mornings and you gotta manage them differently depending on what day of the week it is. Mm -hmm. Now as you go higher up in management, so first line management, you don't run into those problems as much. But I was a first line manager for seven years before I became a manager of managers. And you see all sorts of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, but you just, you just deal with it and you know, you figure out what's gonna work and what doesn't. So. Like we're very, very small. We've been doing computers, there's like three of us and we 
need to hire or bring up some people. But what I tend to find is I spend all this time training them and doing them stuff, and then they don't really do. So like, how do you realize when it's you're you're just better to just do it yourself, and when you're better to waste your time training people that may or may not do? Like, is there some well, there's this old joke, like if you point the finger at somebody, there's three pointing back at you. So that's why I point at people like this. <laughs> so a lot of it's like, what is this a consistent problem? If it's a consistent problem, is it you or is it them? That's hard for me to tell. So is it like, are you not letting go, or you know, you're 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 hiring well, more people? Well, because we're small and we're scrappy, and you know, and people, you, you don't pay people, then or you pay them in commission. You know what I mean, like. So if they're it's all hard. gung ho and they're like, oh, and so they tell you, I want to do this, and they waste, I mean, yeah. really waste your time, which I say to everyone, please don't waste my time. I don't give two shits if you do this yeah. at all. Like, yeah. I want you to call. I don't call people if they don't call me back. Like, but I'm just wondering, at like, what point? Like, should I just be like, you know what, screw it, I'm just going to keep doing this myself because we're moving, or? Well, you have to scale. So when you're when you're scaling the company, what? you've got to say what. What are the skill sets that I need to bring into this company? You know, who, you know, what do I need to get done? Work backwards from that. What are the skill sets I need to accomplish that? Is this going to significantly diff is this a part of my differentiation? Is this part of my sustainable competitive advantage? Is this part of my unique value proposition? If it's that type of a core competency, you hire the person. So you find the right person that has that skill set, you bring them on board. Hopefully, if you're a small company, they don't need a lot of training. They might be a little bit of a mercenary. But hopefully, you're able to at least hire for culture a little bit. Because if you don't hire for a cultural fit with the ability to work with the team, you're going to end up with a bunch of psychotics. And you know, then you have 100 of them, and then you're out of control. Yeah. And that's most companies. It's like dating, basically. So, yeah. You bring someone on. You yeah, you, you're, on you're, you're, you basically, you how crazy if, when I'm interviewing executives, I meet with them at least four times, plus talk to them on the phone. I meet them at dinner, I meet them at breakfast, I go do that's something else. Time. I'm like, you know, can this person, would I put this person in front of a customer? You know, so all of those different things, just to see how they are, and is this somebody that I can work with? Because I, I need to be able to work with people. If it's just they're brilliant and they would be in a silo, and I've been on management teams like this where they're brilliant people, but they were like hating each other and they backbiting and just, I'm like, this is insanity. You know, this isn't any fun. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah. So I do like a workplace culture and employee efficiency, like how can you really develop that? So like in that case you're just talking about now, what do you do in that situation? Like, who kind of comes in? Do you come in? Like, who can kind of set people straight and you know, maybe help managers uh, lead a team better? I mean, how does it? I mean, after you've already got yeah, like, after you've got the crazy people on board. Like, the product is really good. Like, this is something vital about this. But then you realize you've got to dig into <coughs> to make sure that money is well spent and time, you know, that time is not wasted and there's no drama that people are communicating with. How do you make sure? And, and, how do you develop that? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm not a huge believer in cultural change, especially for large companies. With smaller companies, maybe there's a chance. A lot of it's what the CEO and the management team does, not even what they say, but what they do. You know, people are watching your feet more than they're watching your lips. So if they truly want to change things, they earn enough power and authority that you make changes. I remember uh, at CQ Microsystems, there was a big problem in our consumer our consumer business. And I was running corporate strategy, and the CEO said, can you, can you jump in and help this? I'm like, I really don't want to. He said, well, I, I want you to do this. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, so I'm like, I jump in, and it was a mess. I mean, I had a 40-person team, you know, but you can't fire like 20 people. You won't get any work done. <laughs> so you like look at it, and you're like, OK, this person is good, but they should actually be in this role. And this person is a disaster, so I get gotta get rid of them. And over a year and a half, you know, cleaned it up, went from 40 to 30, much more productive. But you can't expect short-term fixes. You know, it's a process. It's not an event. Yeah, you know, it's not like I lay my hands on the company and it's magically healed. You know, I'm not a faith healer. It's like the shit's hard. I mean, but all of it's hard. You know, every, I've never, I mean, like I said, I'm a grinder. You know, I, I've never been in one of those positions where it's like, oh, this is easy today. Even when things are in rapid growth, it's like, I see over the horizon, we're going to have a problem, so we got to solve problems to kind of avoid some of these things that are coming down the road. So it's just, it's, 
it's hard. Right, work. Gross seems scary. I feel like I hold back. Like it starts to move, and then like shit, we don't know what we're doing, and then like yeah. And like, is that? I mean, that's probably a normal thing, right? Where you want like it, the you unknown, see it launching, and you're like, yeah, the unknown is scary. And, then you and maybe back. it's that you're you're like, I don't have the skill set to do that. Yeah, that's exactly. So then get get a mentor, get somebody that's you know your guide by your side that has been through that and knows your business and kind of does that. Anybody, I mean, that would be the best advice. That yes, you know, what would I do different? I would consciously develop mentoring relationships. I've been very fortunate that I've had some really good mentoring relationships that have just kind of happened in my career. Outside of the industry, so it's yeah, like so helpful. I think yeah, seeking awesome. out the right people that you know you trust and respect that has traveled that path before and that you can have a good dialogue with because I'm. You know, I'm not everybody's cup of tea, so it's like having a mentor that doesn't like this variety of tea is not a good thing. So how are you going to deal with somebody like that? You know, you want to be able to listen to them and trust them and those kinds of things. I think the other thing would be get in a mastermind group. Get in a group of like-minded peers, individuals, it doesn't have to be YPO, it, you know, it doesn't have to be Vistage, but get a, a group, of, like an accountability group of, you know, six to eight people where you meet on a regular basis at least once a month and you know go through your business plans, bounce off your business ideas, do things like that. I think those can really revolutionize how you think and how, how you do work. Thank you, Patrick. I really hate to shut you down. Yeah, but, really um, I'll be here all week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs>